Good evening, everyone. We're going to speak about uh, the upcoming parasha, Parashat Kedoshim. As the parasha begins, Kedoshim tiyu ki kadosh ani. Akash Baruch Hu is demanding from every Jew to be holy because he's holy. It's very interesting. Many of the Jews think it's who has to be holy? The rabbis. The bigger they are, the holier they have to get. What does it have to do with me? I'm a simple guy or a simple girl. I don't have to be holy. It's, it's, a, it's a great achievement that I keep some mitzvot here and there. I'm traditional. That's good enough for me. I'm not, it's not talking about me. But you know, when Hashem speaks, it's very precise. And when He speaks to the Jewish nation, who is he speaking to? To the entire nation. Kedoshim to you. It's an obligation for every Jew to be holy. The question that we have to ask, what exactly it means to be holy? When God comes to people and say to them, you have to be holy because I'm holy. What does it mean? This sentence is, very, is a very important sentence in the Torah. It's a verse. It's crucial to understand it. What's the demand here? If the demand is A, we must do A. If it's B, we have to do B. If we don't have an understanding, what does it mean? Without knowing your assignment, there is any chance for you to succeed in it? So if the purpose of life is to be holy for every Jew, that's what Hashem demands for every one of us, and we don't understand the term holy, what does it mean to be holy? How exactly are we going to fulfill our mission in life? That's the question we have to ask ourselves in a very loud voice. This is the way it begins. Vaidaber Hashem el Moshe le'emor. Every time it says in the Torah, Vaidaber Hashem el Moshe, without the word le'emor, that means it's a private conversation between Hashem and Moshe. Every time it says le'emor, to say, meaning you only passing my message as a messenger to the nation. Vaidaber Hashem el Moshe le'emor. Le'emor means to tell. To pass the message on. Daber el kol adat bnei Israel. Speak to the nation of Israel. Ve'amarta alehem. You should say to them. Kedoshim tiyu ki kadosh ani Hashem elokechem. You have to be holy because I am your God. I'm holy. I am the holy God. Okay. The Midrash, which is a part of the oral Torah, the Midrash is asking, it's uh, Vaikra Rabba, 24, the Midrash. It's, you know, we have Midrash Rabba, it's a substantial Midrash. We have Midrash Tanchuma, we have many Midrashim. Maybe perhaps the most important Midrash is Midrash Rabba. It gives a lot of secrets about the parasha and all kinds of secrets of Chazal that they knew and they, and they eventually was written in a Midrash 1800 years ago. So the Midrash is asking, Yahol Kamoni, what does it mean you should be holy like me? It's a joke. What? A person can reach the holiness of God? What does it mean? You have to be holy because I'm holy. Very nice, you're holy. What do you want from me? I'm a half animal. Half animal, half soul. So right away I have half animal in me. I can never be you. You're 100% spiritual. We are half spiritual, half animal. There's any chance we can ever reach your level? We, don't, we can't even determine if we live or die. It's not in our hand. We, cannot, we don't have full control on what we do. So what does it mean you have to be holy because I'm holy? The answer is... What is it, first of all, what does it come to teach us? Every kid knows that the holiness of Hashem is definitely by far nothing to compare between these two people that were born from, you know, from material, <coughs> that came from the sand, from the dust. It means like this. It means you should know one thing. Why I'm holy? Because you have the power to make me holy. The more you're going to do what I told you, the more you're going to make me holy. That's very serious what I just said. But it's the Midrash. If it wouldn't be a Midrash, I wouldn't dare to say it. Once it's written in a Midrash, you're safe. It comes from Chazal, not from someone from the street, right? I'll read it to you in Hebrew. 
כל הקדושה שלי למעלה, הוא רק מקדושתכם. All my holiness in the upper world, it's all thanks to your holiness in this world, in this physical world. You actually making me holy up there. Before we try to understand what it means, this Midrash, we have, if you remember, just uh, less than a month ago, we read the Haggadah of Pesach in Pesach. We read it on the night of Lela Seder, we read the Haggadah. In the Haggadah, in the beginning, in the first two, three pages, there is a very interesting part from the Zohar, from the Holy Zohar. The Zohar is talking about that when the Jewish nation opening their Haggadot and begin to talk about the story of the Exodus of Egypt, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gather all the angels in the upper world, all of them, and he gives them like a speech. All, I gathered all of you to see how great is my children. Look how they all sit together and praising me all night for the miracles that I did to them in Egypt and I, the way I took them out. And at that time the Zohar say that we, the Jewish nation, giving Hashem, kivyachol, supposedly, let's put a highlight on the word supposedly, because it's all, what, what I'm saying here, it's all metaphoric. What does it mean metaphoric? If you don't understand it correctly, chas v'shalom, it can turn into kfirah. You have to be very careful. It can, it can be infidelity. So metaphorically, Hashem is counting it like he's getting his strength thanks to the story that we tell the night of Lela Seder that we praise him for taking us out of Egypt. It's like we're giving him koach. Chayil, in Aramik, it's, it's koach. It's written in the Torah, Hashem is giving you the strength. But here it's, it's vice versa. Who gives Hashem koach and glory by us praising Him in the night of Passover is giving Him more strength. Now, it's, it sounds a little bit strange. We all know, every fool knows, it's also in the, it's in the 13th principle of Judaism, that Hashem is super perfect. It cannot be any more perfect than what Hashem is. It's perfect. It's not, he has no limitation. He has no chas v'shalom, any defect. Or there's nothing he wants to do, he cannot do. He has no limitation on controlling billions of people simultaneously to create anything he wants, to supervise to the smallest detail. He doesn't have fatigue. He doesn't need to work physically for anything. Everything by him is super spiritual. We don't even have a billion of 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 until tomorrow of a percent of understanding what is Hashem or who is Hashem. We don't have any understanding. The, the 0 0.00000 percent that we understand, 1 percent, right? The tiny crumb from a huge cake that we finally got is that Hashem is speaking to us in a language, like the Rambam writes, in a language that we will be able to connect, in a language that we understand. Really, technically, when we die and we go to the spiritual world without the body, we will get the right picture. All the questions, and dilemmas, and misunderstandings, and all kinds of things that we have in our mind, that confusions, in a second will all vanish. Because finally we'll be able to, to understand the entire picture. But right now in this world, which, are, which is very limited, we are very limited in the body, we are limited in our memory, in our capacity, in our understanding, in our sharpness, in our physical strength. We have so many limitations. So the way we are, with a combination of a body and a soul, and with so many question marks around us about the creation and about the way Hashem runs the world, and the little that we know comes from our Torah. It's true that the more you dig and dig in the Torah, you discover more and more and more. But it's, no matter how much you know, you know the whole Torah, you know so much, you still won't know who is Hashem. There's no, no understanding of who is Hashem. So the Rambam says, Rambam says, If I knew everything about Hashem, I would be Him. Because to know Hashem 100% the way He is, 
with all his skills and abilities, if you reach that level, that means you are him. Because there's no way to reach him unless you are him. Meaning nobody will ever reach this level. Not the angels, not the souls, nobody. There's no way to understand who is Hashem because it's way above our understanding. It's also written in the Tanakh, Ki lo My thoughts and your thoughts is not the same channel. You're, you're working a certain channel, which is very limited. And the way I think and the way I run so many billions and trillions of thoughts that connects all together and it all goes into my computer and I analyze everything in a millionth of a second and every millionth of a second of my response can either save the world or destroy the world. A, a tiny delay in Hashem reaction which is a millionth of a percent, a millionth of a percent delay in his reaction can destroy the world. By us, <laughs> big deal, no difference. It's no difference. You can get a little understanding if you sit in a stock market and you buy and sell stocks for huge multi-billion companies. So every time you press a button, it's hundreds of millions of dollars left or right. So if you delayed by a tenth of a second, by pressing the button, that could be already $10 million difference. The way the numbers are running so quick, and if you misunderstood, that's why they put the sharpest brain on the floor in Wall Street, and many of them are Bachurei Shiva, used to learn Yeshivot, very sharp brains. As soon as the information comes, when they open the stock market in the morning, they decide buy and sell, and they are so, so sharp, these people, the way they analyze the picture, so uh, this, if it takes them another three seconds to say buy and sell, the companies would either make or lose maybe tens of millions of dollars. That's how critical every second is. And this is, <laughs> this is in money in a, sm in a world like this. Imagine by Hashem, decisions, shooting a missile, the missile will miss by a tenth of a second, will be a little bit early or a little bit fast. The, 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 the car of the president just passed. Tenth of a second, if it would hit, the world is finished. Who knows, a nuclear war, hundreds of millions will die. Since he passed, no big deal. It's affecting the whole world. It's the butterfly effect. So Hashem said to us, and we read it in the Haggadah of Pesach, He said to the angels, look how my children giving me strength. Now you may ask, so in that case, what does it mean giving me strength? If you're super perfect, I cannot make you more perfect than what you are. So what kind of strength we give you? The answer is strength to act in justice. I'm giving you strength. We're giving him strength to be able to exercise the ju by justice what he wants to do. Let me give you an example. You are a judge in court. And you're the only judge in town. And one of the people you have to judge is your cousin. You grew up with him together. The last thing you want is to put your cousin in jail. So what do you say to your cousin before the trial? Give me strength to set you free. How? Do this, do that, run, do this, supply this, supply proof. Do something that when you come in front of me, I'll be able to let you go without contradicting my own rules. I set up the constitution, I gave the Torah, I made rules. Righteous get good, wicked get punished. So if you're not going to do the right thing, when it comes, I won't be able to give you what I want to give you. Because the Satan will object right away. He will say, excuse me, where did we find a perfect example for that? The perfect example that we found for that was when we came out of Egypt. The war that were in front, everybody started to cry and scream. Why you took us out of Egypt now to die over here? They saw the Egyptians are chasing them with carriages and horses and, and some weapon. They got very nervous. They started to cry to Hashem. And the Satan said to Hashem, please, it's not going to be fair if you open this water. It's not going to be justice. They don't deserve to get saved. They don't deserve. Why they don't deserve? Mamash, like a trial. 
it's, it's working very fast. It's not like here, everything here take months. Until the judge open his ear and until he decide and until come next week, come in the next month, we'll give you an answer in eight months. Over there it's less, it's much seconds. So the Satan comes and he says, they don't have any merit to open the water for them. I'm sorry. They are nothing better than the Egyptians. The Egyptians got killed because they're all idol worshippers. They lost their country. They paid a very heavy price. And these Jews are nothing better. Look at them, how they scream. After everything they saw, that what you did for them, they're still screaming and don't have faith in you. What reason you have to split the water for them? They deserve it? They don't deserve it. So what changed everything? Nachshon ben Aminadav, he ran into the water, and he said, if Hashem promised he's going to take us out of Egypt and give us the Torah and bring us to the Holy Land, I have nothing to fear. I do what I have to do. If I drown, later I'll ask him, how come? You contradicted yourself. But now, that's what you promise. I don't ask questions. He doesn't ask questions. You say that my children will come from Yitzchak. Now you tell me to go and kill him. It's a contradiction. I don't ask. Whatever you tell me last, that's what I do. You change your mind, whatever. I'm not asking. What do you mean? What? You promised me one thing and now you want to take it back? What? You fooled me? You lied to me? What? Nothing. Take and kick, go and kill your son? Yes, sir. Five in the morning is already ready to do it. Doesn't wait. Right away. So Nachshon started to walk and Hashem said to the Satan, no, what do you have to say now? Look, everybody started to walk after him. They got brave. All you need is one pioneer. He runs to the war after me. And everybody runs. In Hebrew, how do you call in Hebrew, in the holy language, how do you call an officer in the army, a general? How do you call him? What's the right word? Huh? Katsin. Did you hear about it? Katsin. Katsin is a big officer. One of the, the chiefs of the army. Where does the word Katsin come from? From what word? If you break it, katsin, what's the root of the word? Katse. Katse. Katse, what does it mean, katse? Edge. Meaning either in the front or in the back. You have a car. The edge of the car, it's either the front or the back, right? That's the edge. Not the middle. The edge. Either one edge or the other edge. Katsin is either someone who leads everyone after him, that's the way it should be, not somebody who hides, like in the Nasrallah, eight floors under the ground in his bunker with all kinds of protections and give instruction to the foolish terrorists to go and kill themselves when he's eating steak while they're getting killed. That's not a Katsin. Katsin means he runs first after me. And everyone becomes brave and they follow him, like David Amelech. Or someone that protects from the back, because they, if, they if they chase them, he's going to be the first one to face them. So he's already in the highest jeopardy. Either I'm going to face the enemy, I'm the first row, or if the enemy comes from the back, I'm the first one. One way or the other, I'm, go I'm exposed more than the others. Why is it? It gives strength to the soldiers. If our chief is so brave and he runs for the target, everybody psychologically becomes strong. This is how it goes. So, this is what's going on here. It says like this, the Midrash says, just like that we read in the Haggadah, Kedushati lemala, all my holiness up there come from your holiness right here, in this lower world. The more a person keeps his Kedusha over here, the more the Kedusha of Hashem in the upper world is becoming stronger and stronger. And this is what we say in the Kaddish. What do we say in the Kaddish? I once explained the secrets of the Kaddish. What's the Kaddish? What's the secret of this Kaddish? Or repeats, repeats it hundreds of times in Shul a week. Hundreds of times, again and again. Shachrit, Mincha, Arvit. What's the purpose of it? So the world has four categories. It has the Creator. It has the world, it has the people, and it has the purpose. God, the world, 
the people and the purpose. So the Kaddish begins, it gadal vit kadash merabba, we talks about Hashem. The name of Hashem should be greater and holy. That's how we start the Kaddish. And everybody answer Amen and cut. Now we're going to the second category, it's in the world. Ba'almadi Barak in the world he created as he wished. So now he's speaking about the world. And everybody answer Amen. So we cut now. We go to the third category. And everybody say Bechaychon, of Yomechon, of Chedechol Bet Israel. So now we're talking about people, your life, the nation of Israel. So the third category is the people. So we had Hashem, we had the world, we had the people. And what's the fourth category? It's the purpose. What's the purpose? Uh, there is an Amen, cut. And now everyone together answer. Amen, Yeshme Rabba, Mevarach, Lealam, Lealme Almaya, Itbarach, Vishtabach, Vitpar, Vitroma, Vitnase, Vitadar, Vitale, Vitalal. All these praises that the name of Hashem will be greater and holier and glory and all. And fame. But how the Kaddish begins? Right away, it gadal vit kadash. The name of Hashem should be greater and holier. This is what the Kaddish is. Our job in the world is to make Hashem holier. And not only that, we also answer the rest of the things we have to do. Kiddush Hashem. To sanctify His name. Now it leads us to the question that I asked you 20 minutes ago. What does it mean really to be holy? Now we know that we have the power to make Hashem holy by making ourselves holy. Meaning that Hashem can be holier thanks to me and him and her and him. This is what it means. So now tell me please, how can, Hashem, tell me, how can I make you holy? That's, what, that's my wish, I want to make you holy. So if the way to make you holy is to make myself holy, no problem, show me how to do it. And this is what this parasha is all about. Parashat Kedoshim is talking about what Hashem wants us and how to make him holy. We're going to read some of the things here. So, let's see. Some of the things in the parasha, right away. Ish imo ve'aviv tirao ve'et shabetotai tishmoru ani Hashem. You have to fear your mother and your father, and you have to keep my Shabbat. I'm your God. What's the connection? Your mother and father in the same sentence pushing Shabbat in. What's the connection? The connection is that it's very common today that there are parents who force their children not to keep Shabbat. The children wants to become Shomer Shabbat or they go to Yeshiva and the parents interfere with their choices. They don't want them to, make, to be Shomer Shabbat. Get in a car! You don't tell your father what to do. No, no, I don't want to be driving the Shabbat. I'll stay home. No, you're young. What are you going to do home for the whole Shabbat? We're going to France for the weekend. Get in a car. No, I don't want. Make me coffee. No, I cannot light fire on. And it causes fights. Many of these kids, they surrender to their parents. So the Torah says, it's important you listen to your parents. Important you fear them, meaning respect them. But it's much more important to listen to me, meaning all the things that I tell you to respect and to fear and to honor your parents, it's only subject to. If they are not telling you to do anything against me, against my Torah and against my chief rabbis of every generation. As soon as they turn into my enemies, meaning they're ruining my agenda, by telling you to do the opposite of what I wrote in my Torah, all this law of fearing and respecting them collapse immediately. They don't deserve respect and you don't have to listen to them. I come before your father and your mother. Why did it start when it comes to fear? It starts with the mother. Ish, imo ve'aviv tirau. But when it says respect your father and mother, it first say father. 
When it comes to respect, it started with the father, then the mother. When it comes to fear, it started with the mother, then the father. Why? Because it goes based on the nature of the people. Between the father and mother, usually the kids afraid of who? Not the mother. They fool the mother as much as they want. Soon as the father comes home from work, they hide under the bed. <laughs> what happened? First thing, when a kid get into trouble in school, what is he begging his rabbi? Please don't tell my father, please. You never hear, please don't tell my mother. Because with the mother, we'll somehow make it. Mommy, you don't understand, this teacher, it's his fault. Okay, son, come, I'll buy you a pizza. <laughs> Not only did he get a punishment, he got a reward. But with his father, he's shaking. All, all day he's nervous when he comes home. What? You got suspended? As soon as his father comes home, he faints. So the father, you fear anyway. Some people in the past generation, the father didn't have to talk. All he had to do is to look. And all the kids got the point. Nobody had to, he didn't have to tell you what to do. You made noise, he gave you a look. He got the point. It was obvious. You came to shul, you don't pray, your father looks at you like this. Why? You don't fear Hashem, you fear your father, fine. Fear, naturally you fear your father. Therefore the Torah had to encourage you to fear your mother, so it started with the mother. Respect, people respect their mother more than respect the father. And also love them more. Why? Because the mother always protects them. When the father wants to give them a punishment, who's their lawyer? The mother. No, Moshe, please, don't, don't give him a smack. No, no, don't put him in a room. Moshe, I need his help. She will find a way to get him out. Good lawyer. So he respects and loves his mother more. That's why the Torah says, Kabed et avicha and retimecha. Whatever you normally do anyway, came second. What you're not good at, came first. Everything in the Torah, it's calculated. Now, what does it mean to be holy? The word holiness is not what people think. Most of the people, ask, go to Boro Park, stop a hundred religious people on the street, that each one of them has a very beautiful long beard and a beautiful sombrero, <laughs> and ask them over there. In Boro Park, in Monroe, in Lakewood, in Monsi, in Yerushalayim, in Bnei Brak, doesn't matter where. Everywhere you have ultra orthodox people, make a survey. Ask a hundred people on the street, what does it mean to be holy? I promise you the majority of them will not know. I don't want to say 90% or 70%, only Hashem knows. But the majority from what I've seen over the years, they don't know what it means to be holy. When you ask people, describe what it means to be holy, so they begin to describe a big rebbe. He had, Baruch Hashem, a special, special, uh, you know, hat and a very nice white beard. And, you know, usually some of these tzaddikim, when they pray, they, they make faces and they cry and who knows what. So this is the way he described being holy means. Or is he wear a special jalabiya. I had a guest, a Moroccan guest, that still keep the tradition of his grandparents in Morocco. So he came to my house from overseas. And when he arrived to us, he asked me permission if he can wear his jalabiya on Shabbat. <laughs> A city of 99% Ashkenazim, Litvish, and Hasidim. Imagine now he will wear his jalabiya on the street. That's it, my, my house will have a mark on the door. <laughs> Taliban, <laughs> you know? Baruch Hashem, I have a shul in my house. So we don't have to walk in the street, so it stays in home. You know, Baruch Hashem. But the idea is that when you see people that wear jalabiya, like the Baba Sali or the Ben Ishchai and the turbans that they used to have, you cannot deny that you get the impression in your mind, wow, what holy people. Right? You see a picture of the Rambam with his turban. You see the chief rabbi of Israel, the Sfaradim, they wear this special turban and a special kilt. All these things makes the people understand this is a holy authority. 
The question is, and the mistake that most people do is that the alphabet or the beard is the last thing that makes a person holy. Because if that's the indication of who is holy and who is not, 90% of the murderers in the Muslim world are super holy. They all have turbans and beards and jalabiyas and few guns. So if jalabiyah and beard and turban makes a person holy, ooh, ah, we have a serious problem right now. You know the joke. Moshe and Mustafa had an argument which religion has more holy people. <laughs> so the Arabs say, what are you joking? We are almost two billion Arabs. You Jews are barely 13 million people. You arguing with me who has more holy people? So the, the Jews say to him, you know what? For every name is holy in Islam. You mention, you pull one hair from my beard. And every name I mention in Judaism, I'll pull one hair from your beard. You agree? So the Arab is sure that he's going to win. So of course, good, fair deal. So the Arab say, okay, I start. He say, fine, the Arab is thinking, soon I'm gonna shave the Jew, and he won't have what to say anymore, that's it. So the Arab pull one hair, Mustafa, one came out. Muhammad, Mahmoud, Abdallah, Atala, Ahmed, Ali, seven, eight heirs, came out, finished. Mustafa is stuck. <laughs> so Moshe said to him, no, you done? He's thinking, thinking, ran out of names. The Jew said, okay, it's my turn now. <laughs> he grabbed his hair, his, his whole beard, in one shot. Pulled everything like this. <laughs> Everything came out, shaved him. This is only for Rabbi Akiva and his 24,000 Talmidim. <laughs> now let's start with the rest of the list. Nice joke, but let's go back to reality. How people consider you holy, they judging you by the way you look. Where, who can give me a source in a Torah, in a Tanakh? In a Tanakh? that the way a person look does not indicate about his spiritual level. Even though, listen, don't, um, don't, don't misunderstand what I say. Of course, that many times the holiness of a person is expressed by the way he dress and by the way he looks on the outside. You can see. But that's not the way to judge a person. You understand what I'm saying? Holiness of a person can cause him to dress in a certain way or to have a certain beard or a certain hat or to behave in a certain way when he prays. The holiness of a person. But what makes a person holy is not the way he dress. The way he dress can affect the inside of a person also. I'll give you an example. If a person walks with a little yarmulke size of a quarter, and a pink shirt with all kinds of flowers <laughs> and white shoes open up like <laughs> slippers, you know, and short, short <laughs> pants and, you know, a t-shirt cut, sleeveless, walks in the street like this with a Mexican sombrero and a mustache. He walks like this on the street. What guard he has to stay righteous? He looks 100% like a goy. The way he dressed, the way... Nothing, nothing turns the fact that he's a Jew. Therefore, he doesn't have any guard to keep him on track. Now you come and say to him, get rid of this clown outfit. You dressed him, nice jacket, nice elegant, white shirt. You give him a black hat of the Orthodox people. You make him grow a little bit beard, at least a little bit. And you keep him like this for a month. And you come after a month and you see how he behaved when he was dressed like a clown for one month. And how he is now when he dressed like this for a month. Of course, he's not, I, did, I didn't say that he became the Rambam in one month. But you can see a big difference. So we cannot deny the fact that the way you dress from the outside, what you choose to wear and the way you dress, affecting your spirituality from the inside. But again, don't make mistake. 
What comes first is your internal holiness, and we were going to explain what it means, Kedoshim to you, in a few minutes. So, where does it say in the Tanakh that the way a person looks doesn't make him holy? The answer is, the mother of Shimshon, she did not have kids. Her name was, who knows what was her name? The father was Manoach. Manoach. What was the name of the mother of Shimshon? Samson in English. Samson and Delilah, Shimshon and Lila became Samson and Delilah. Samson phone. He changed his name to Samson. No. So Shimshon and Lila, where his father was Manoach, wasn't a big rabbi. Manoach. And his mother, what was her name? Who knows? Very good. Tzlalfonit. You'll, you'll never find anyone with this name in Israel, to the best of my knowledge. Tzlalfonit. Top, Tzlalfonit. She doesn't have kids. One day Hashem sends her an angel. Looking like a person. Any times Hashem sends angels, they come exactly like people. They come, they talk, they came to Avram Avinu, they came to Lot, they went to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. They look like people. Eliyahu Anavi comes as a human being and speak to people, you don't even know it was him. So it's a common thing. Today maybe less than previous generation, but it's a common thing. So the angel came to her and he gave her a message that she's going to be, to have a baby, finally. And then, after he left, she realized it was the man of God. The way he left, she realized it was an angel. So the Gemara said, the Gemara asked a question. How did Slalfonit know that he's a man of God? Why the Gemara asked such a question? It's obvious. He had a very nice white beard and a jalabiya and a beautiful turban. What do you mean? How did she know he's a man of God? By the way, he looks. He looks very religious. Rabbi, he had such a long beard, he had to see. I was sure he's the minimum, the chief rabbi of Israel. Minimum. The way he was dressed, this, rabbi, but he stole all my money, rabbi. What am I going to do? How do you expect him to come to steal your money? With jeans and sandals? You won't give him a penny. The only way you give him money, because he came with a beer and a sombrero. What, what did you expect? In Israel, in Meron, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai grave, there was one Baba sitting for 20 years with the Jalabiya, special things, a beard, all day pretending, reading Tehillim. And people come, they put a lot of money in his jar. The jar was growing every year a little bit wider to, you know, to fit how much money people used to put in. And after 20 years, they found out he's nothing but a Muslim Arab. Not even a Jew. Not to talk about a Chacham, a Baba. So after they discovered that he's a crook, pretending that he's a rabbi, they asked him, but why did you tell people you have to keep Shabbat, don't ever miss Tfilin, make sure you pray with all your heart to Hashem, Retailim, you gave good advices, like a real rabbi. <laughs> so the Arabs said, what did you expect me to tell them? Come to the mosque? <laughs> I'm sitting here by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. I have to tell them what they want to hear. How else will I fool them? Come with me to Mecca. <laughs> That's what I don't get. So, what does it mean to be holy? The Gemara asks, how did she know he's holy? By the fact that the Gemara asked this question, meaning there is no way to know about a person if he's holy by looking at him. Did you hear me or no? Because if there was a way to look at a person and know he's holy, the Gemara would not ask that question. The Gemara don't ask stupid questions or rhetorical questions. If the Gemara says, how did she know he's holy? That means, there is, if there was a way to know his holy by looking at him, the Gemara wouldn't ask. How did she know his holy? She saw his beard and his turban, and she realized that he's a holy man. No, no, no. 
For the Gemara, it's nothing. By the way, when you read in the Talmud about all kinds of wicked people, the Talmud speaks about wicked people that used to live in the time of Chazal. What do you think? How do you think these people looked? Imagine 2,000 years ago, there was no Gillette. So everyone had a beautiful beard, right? So everyone. Everyone walked with a turban. Everyone, even the Goim. Everyone had hats, even in Europe, 70, 80 years ago. All the Europeans used to have hats. In all black and white movies of Germans and Italians and British. They look in the streets of London, Paris, in Italy. Everybody had a cover on their head, regardless of religion. Nothing to do with religion. That was the way people were for 2,000 years. Everybody covered their head. When they used to come to a place, they used to hang the hat. And when they used to respect a person, they used to take the hat for him. It was a way of life. Everybody. So therefore, everyone had a turban back then in the Islamic countries, in the Arab countries. And everyone had a beard and everyone wore dresses. So even the biggest murderer and a crook in the time of the Talmud look like the chief rabbi today. What? With his outfit. So what? So, not, so because he looks like that, it, that means he's not a crook. So what does it mean to be holy? The answer is to be separated from the goyim and not only from the goyim, from the nonsense and from the rotten ideologies of the wicked people in the world. That's what it means to be holy. To be separated. Separated from the naked people on the street. Separated from all the infidels. Separated from people that are addicted to sport and that's their life. Separated from all the people who eat non-stop and grow up like balloons. All day sitting in restaurants and swallowing all kinds of things. Because they don't, they, they don't have any spirituality in their life. It's all physical separated from all the crooks and the liars and the thieves in business, separated from people without faith, separated from people who do not pray, separated from people who walk like this on the street without covering their hair, no kippah, no tzitzit, going to places they're not supposed to, separated from the reform people who took the Torah of God and made it into a toilet paper, Hashem Irachem. That for that we have to sit and cry for billions of years for the tragedy that the reform people and the damage that they caused Judaism. Just because they wanted to do everything they feel like, they went and modified the entire Torah from A to Z and did not leave one law original as God gave it. Same thing, the conservative movement, who are more or less 10 to 15 years after the reforms, Whatever you see the reforms doing now, the conservatives usually do about 15 years later. That's it, one generation later. And unfortunately, after the conservative people, you have the ultra-modern orthodoxy. They still call themselves orthodox, modern orthodox. They find all kinds of names and titles, but they are about 15 years behind the conservatives. And then there's another level of modern and another level until we go all the way to the strict. Everybody follow the one in front of him. The conservative follow the reform, the reform follow the goyim, the, the ultra-modern orthodox follow the conservative. Then you have the modern orthodox, which they still keep something. They follow the ultra-modern orthodox. And then you have, you know, all kinds, one follow the other. Until you get, sometimes it looks, like when you look around, it's very difficult to find people that live 100% like the Torah requires. Very difficult with what you see out there. Today I spoke to a dear man about his son. His son was a modern Orthodox boy. He grew up in a family of modern Orthodox parents. The father was listening, started to listen to me a few years ago, and as the years go by, he became more and more ultra-Orthodox. 
and changed a lot of his ideology and became Maruch Hashem. He, he always had great personality, always had good midot, always was nice and polite and generous and respectful and smart person. He had a lot of great skills even before. But now when he started to listen to the way what the Torah really requires from a Jew, slowly, slowly, you know, slowly but surely, he's not a little kid, he's thinking about everything, he became much more religious than what he used to be. As results of that, his son followed him. The mother not so much, or the father and the son, to the point that the son already went to yeshiva. He's working a little bit to make a living, few hours, most of the day he sits and learn Torah now, Baruch Hashem. So the father told me, can you talk to my son about one issue only? One issue. Everything he does, I'm happy. One thing concerns me. Every time they offer him a girl, his first question is if this girl will wear a long, not modest wig, or if she, is he allow her to wear a wig as her husband? Ashkenazim. Ashkenazim. He's allow, allowing her to wear a wig, but he wants the wig to be short and modest. As all the Ashkenazim rabbis that allow the wig, that's what they had in mind. It's very simple. Nobody, the idea of modesty by a woman, that a woman when she leaves the house will attract less attention to her, not more. Meaning everything she does that it's prov provocative according to the time and the place where she lives. Even if not necessarily, I give you an example. If she wants to put a wig, very short. Not curly and wide and very long that it flies with the wind and cover the entire block. Not this kind of wigs. She wants to put a very short wig but the color is purple. Purple, purple, no, Baruch Hashem. Blue, red, orange. You know, I travel a lot. Where do I find out how dirty the world became? Where? In the airport. <laughs> From one airport to the other. So you go to different cities in the world and you see all kinds of creature. <laughs> 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 I said, why so what? Am I in this world or I already maybe moved to a different planet? <laughs> all kinds of earrings and all kinds of strange things and weird tattoos. <laughs> I don't go to I don't go to subway and I don't walk on the street. So the only time I'm coming in contact with Goim is usually by the airport. <laughs> And that's when I began, not necessarily Goyim, it's also Hashem Yirachem, many of the Jews who imitate the Goyim. That's what they see on television, and that's, what they, that's the way it's affected, if it affects them. So she wants to wear a short, modest wig, very short, straight, not long, and pro but purple. Allowed or not allowed? Very big sin. Why? Every man on the street would look at her. Out of it. It's, it's, it's a normal act. What? Purple wig? What's a new style? So automatically it attracts millions of eyes to her every day. This is the laws of modesty. The laws of modesty is when you come out of your house, almost nobody looked at you. Nobody looked because there's nothing to look at. You cover yourself, you're 100%. So between you and Hashem, you know if you're clean or not. And most of these women who call themselves orthodox, if you connect them to a lie detector, and you tell them, do you think that you are behaving according to what God expects from you when it comes to modesty? Then you will see what I'm talking about. The hand of the light detector will break 500 times a day. You know, it keeps going to the negative. Boom, 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 boom. Eventually, why? Because a person deep inside of him knows he lives in a lie. If they do it according to the halacha, if the if they posek allow it, obviously, and they do based on what he said, then they should know that there's no posek that allowed this provocative, long, and multicolor wigs. It's not, nobody allows it. The idea of modesty is to cover your hair and not to attract attention. If you cover your personal hair, which is a mitzvah to do, 
And by doing it, you're creating yourself a bigger problem when you default on the laws of modesty. What did you do by that? You did one mitzvah and caused yourself to create another sin on yourself? So what did you do by that? What is it? It's like a person, you, the dollar goes up and the shekel goes down, or, or the other way around. So what does he do? He buy a thousand dollars and he buy four thousand shekel. What happened? The dollar goes up, so he makes money on the dollar, but he loses on the shekel. Shekel goes up, he makes money on the shekel, he loses on the... What did you do by that? How, you're never going to make money. You always stay the same. The idea is to be more modest. You cover your hair, beautiful. But not only just cover. If you cover, stay modest. Don't cover with something that looks even greater than your natural hair. Because by that, who are you fooling? So this is the idea. So the father told me, can you do me a favor? Tell my son, at least don't put an X on a date with a girl until you see her at least once. Why? Because the last few girls that wanted him, very handsome boy, he didn't want any one of them because they already declared in the resume that they want a dress, high heels and long skirts and tight skirts, mini skirts, Hashem Yirachem, what's going on today? So he doesn't want to even waste time on dating them. So he said, one time he asked me, should I give a chance to a girl that tells me already before I even meet her that she's going to wear a very long and uh, fancy wig? Should I even try? I said, it's against the halacha. You want to marry a sinner? Go and date her. You want to marry a righteous girl. So the father told me today, you are absolutely right. I know you're right. Uh, I'm not denying it. But there is not going to be one girl that will date him in the next few years. All the resumes that all the Shadchanim gave, all of them declared they refused to wear short, modest wigs. We didn't get to that. What do you think, Sfaradi girls, they all run to wear covering their head? What do you think, most of the Sfaradi girls wear wig or no? What do you think? Huh? Most of the Sfaradi girls in the world. Do you know how many Sfaradi, very religious girls I know, they wear wigs? The only Sfaradi that don't wear wigs is those who stick 100% to Chacham Ovadia Yosef, which was very against it. Other Chachmei Sfarad, some of them allowed it. Allowed the modest wigs. So some Moroccans, they have Rav Mashash, many of the other Sfaradim, they follow Rav Ben Zion, Abba Shaul Zatzal, some who follow other Rabbanim of Sfarad. Not all of them were against wigs. There's machloket between Aposkim. Some Sfaradi and Ashkenazi Rabbi are against it, some are allowing it. But like I say for the four times tonight, those who allow it, Allow it with a limit, not all the way sweeping the floor when she walks in the street in King's Highway. Sweeping the floor with a wig. How come your wig used to be blonde and it became half black now? When she walks in the street, it sweeps the floor. So now it's half blonde, half black. A new style. Why? It's all the way down. Anyway. By the way, you know what? I want to tell you something. Unfortunately, we talk about it once in a while. I didn't plan to talk about it, but since we're talking about Kedoshim, the Torah says, Your camp, or the place where you live, should be holy. How is Kadosh? The Torah says in another place, what does it mean to be Kadosh? What does it mean to be Kadosh? To separate from any potential sex crime. How does it start? By lack of modesty. Where does it say it in the Torah? That Hashem said to the Jews, every time I will see in a woman, erva, erva, you look how it's all beautifully connected in the verses. You learn from one verse to another. When the spies went to Israel, when Yosef said to the brothers, you spies, legalot et ervat Mitzrayim batem. You came to discover the erva of Mitzrayim. What does it mean, erva of Mitzrayim? The secret parts of Mitzrayim. What spies come? 
They want to know the nuclear facility in Dimona. They want to know where the Israeli hides all their weapons under the ground. They want to know where the airplanes are under the ground. Things that nobody knows. The spies doesn't come to check the buildings in Tel Aviv. They come to check secret things. Secrets hidden. So Yosef is blaming the brother, you came to teach the erva of Mitzrayim. Erva means something that it's covered, secret. The Torah says, things that's supposed to be covered, but it opens. For instance, the Gemara is teaching us, shok be'isha erva. Erva, it's not only what people think it is. Erva means every part in a woman's body that must be covered when she gets dressed. Meaning all the way from the knees and up, all the way from the elbows and up, everything in the stomach, all parts of the stomach, all parts of the back, all the way from the beginning of the neck down. Above here, it's not erva, the neck. It's no problem. But below the neck, every dot of the woman's body that is open or clothes that are attached to the body that you can see the shape of it, this is a very, very severe, serious, horrible crime against God. But it's not a one-time crime. It goes by how many people are affected by this crime. Meaning if that particular day, 500 men looked at her and had thoughts about her, any kind of thought they had about her, intimate, even it wasn't so dirty, but intimate thought about her, what a pretty woman, what a nice body, I wish my wife one day will look like that. All kinds of thoughts like this. Not to talk about Hashem Rachem, what other things they think. Automatically she gets a new sin into her file. Now you multiply it by 40 years that she walks like this in the street until she becomes very old and walks with a cane. By then she doesn't have what to impress anymore. But from the time she became 12 until she became, I don't know, 62, 50 years, 50 years multiply by how many years she goes on the public, if she's a secretary, she's in the office, she walks in the street, she goes to the supermarket, you know, all these things multiplied by how many men looked at her, not to talk about pictures and films and videos and in, the, in mixed parties and all kinds of places, not to talk chas v'shalom about swimming pool and beach. Hashem irachem. When you add it all together, this woman is done. And that, and nothing will help her because she's machtiat arabim. Even if you say that she does every five minutes a mitzvah. Every five minutes she does a great mitzvah. Every five minutes mitzvah, it's unbelievable. Twelve mitzvot per hour. Multiply by 50 years. How many mitzvot she gonna have? Three million? Four? Five million? Do the math yourself. 12 an hour, multiply by 12 hours that she's out, but she's not sleeping. You know what, make it 16 hours a day. 16 hours a day times 12, almost 200 per day. 200 per day, multiply by 30, 6,000 mitzvot per month. 6,000 mitzvot for 12 months, 72,000 mitzvot a year. 50 years. Almost 400,000, almost, uh, almost, yeah, almost, uh, no, not 4,000, almost 40,000 mitzvot. About for 50, give her, give her a bonus, 50,000 mitzvot. Make it a million. No, I'm in a good mood today. Make it a million. Now let's count one day that she walks in the street in the summertime, not modest. Multiply how many people looked at her every step, especially the busy streets, and then tomorrow, and tomorrow, 50 years like this, thousands of eyes, thousands of eyes every day. And the thoughts is another scene. To look, it's one scene. To think, it's another scene. Another thought, it's another scene. And then what happened from the scenes? He comes home, he fights with his wife, people cheat, they do all kinds of bad things. Women learn from her how to dress. Oh, she's a religious woman from the community. If she dressed like this, that means it's not so bad. The rabbi respect her and her husband very much when they come to shul or to the wedding. That means it's not such a big deal. I can also dress like this. And another girl started to dress like her. And another girl looked at her and also dressed like this. And another girl looked at the other girl who learned from her. 
So now another girl is learning, she doesn't even know her. But in Shamayim she's responsible for her because Rachel learned from Sarah and Miriam learned from Rachel. Miriam never saw Sarah in her life. But Sarah is responsible to destroy Miriam's spirituality and modesty. I never saw her in my life. Did you ever see me? No, I have no idea who you are. You killed her. Because you taught Rachel that taught Miriam how to dress. Multiplied by thousands of girls. Sometimes it's rabbit scent. The rabbit scent, she's not modest. The way she dressed, also very wild wig, also high heels that it's not allowed. Also tight skirt and too short and you know, all kinds of things like this. Also all kinds of lycra that stretch and attach to the body which is against the halakha. Also tons of jewelry all over and tons of perfume. She finished the whole duty free on herself before she left to the street. You understand? And then they wonder why Hashem Yerachem, when they come in front of Hashem, they're going to have a major, major disappointment and surprise. I was a Hashem every day, I read Teilim. Every day, an hour Teilim I read for you. I kept Shabbat, I ate kosher, I did chesed, I cooked for the yeshiva, I taught my children Torah, I, I helped my, my husband, I pushed him to go to learn, I daven twice a day. Why, why, are you, why are you telling me that I'm wicked? Why are you giving me all these millions of millions of sins? I don't remember committing them. But in Shamayim everything is clear. Hear this, look at this. Look at Tony how he looked at you. Look at Ahmed. Look at Muhammad. And not only that, when these Jewish women will come in front of Hashem and they see every man on the street Every low life that look at her when she went to the supermarket, Jose, Amigo, Muhammad, Maharaji from India and Pakistan, all these people, she will also see what they did after they look at her. Imagine the embarrassment in their world of truth. And then they show her, look at, in Israel, it's a very common thing. Look at Muhammad, how he looked at you every day when he did construction in your private home. Every day was low. You know why I was looking at you? Because Fatma is not like this. Where he works, by, in, by his neighborhood, he only see black tents moving. <laughs> he doesn't see high heels and tons of perfume and all these things open. He doesn't see this fashion show. He doesn't see it. So he was looking at you all day, this Muhammad. And then they show her this Muhammad, how he's a terrorist in Hamas, how he goes murder Jewish kids. And what an embarrassment she's going to have. This monster is looking at her every day because she's not modest, religious Jewish woman. What about the Chilul Hashem? What about the Chilul Hashem? That these Arabs murderers, some of them murderers, they look at us and they say, look at them. They are the chosen people. Look how they dress. <laughs> Muhammad the terrorist, if his wife would dress like some of our wives, I don't want to tell you what would happen to her. He will never allow her ever, ever to walk one step like this on the street. You don't believe me? If it was possible, you take 10 very orthodox women that dress with all these fashion shows today and show them to 10 Muhammad terrorists in jail. Go to Israel, murderer one, murderer two, murderer five, and say a thousand dollars a week will give you. Would you let Fatma, your wife, walk like this in the street? Every week you let Fatma dress like this and walk, we'll give you over here in Israeli jail a thousand dollar cash, big money for them. Some of them worked in construction all month, a thousand dollars a month. We'll give you five thousand dollars a month, Muhammad. Let Fatma dress like this. High heels, tight skirt above the knee, wig like this. What would happen? If you get out of the interview with Muhammad alive, we have to do a gomel 500 times. This is the biggest disgrace to us as Jews in this world, the religious. Secular, I'm not even talking about. If you don't get me, if you don't understand what I say, please, I'm begging you, take the Tehillim tomorrow all day and cry and scream to Hashem to open up your heart because it became not frozen, it became a rock. 
The Torah says when Mashiach comes, I will replace your heart of rock with the heart of flesh. That means there will be people that the heart is already not soft anymore. Does not observe Musar ethic. It became like a rock. Nothing penetrates. What does it mean a rock? Solid rock. Nothing penetrates. That's it. Cannot penetrate. So the Torah says, what does it mean, erva? Places in a woman's body that's supposed to be covered. Like I, tell, like, I, like I explained, above the knees, above the elbows, below the neck. Okay. Vera'a becha erva davar. It says right there in the Torah, Vaya machanecha kadosh. Your territory should be holy. Because if not, it means when Hashem will see the hidden places on the women's body, immediately I run away from that place. How ironic, how ironic and sad it is that you find a Jewish woman on Friday before Shabbat starts. She lights all this olive oil, expensive, superb oil, $30 a bottle in a supermarket. She fill up glasses. Size of uh, Gulliver, you know, it's, it's enough until Motzei Shabbat. Baruch Hashem, she's Mahader. So much olive oil, beautiful, the menorah, $5,000 silver menorah right here on the left. She's ready to light Nerot Shabbat. She goes like this for half an hour, bless this, bless that, bless. And all a waste of time, Hashem doesn't even listen to her and he doesn't come to her house because the way she dressed, short sleeves, open V, open in the back, tight skirt, above the knees, and all the rest. With Hashem, there's no games. When he gave the rules, that's the rules. It's not open for negotiation. Especially not when it comes to modesty. By the ladies... Hashem doesn't call a Jewish woman righteous or wicked like he does with a man. By men, tzaddik, rasha, all throughout the entire Tanakh. By the ladies, only we in mother language, we say tzaddiket. You don't find it in the Torah, tzaddiket. What do you see in the Torah? Tznuah, modest. By the ladies, there's only one compliment. Modest or not? Modest or Prutza? Prutza, Shem Yerachem, what it is, I don't even want to say what it means. Do you understand what it means? The Gemara in Masechet Sotah, page 2, the Gemara say, a person gets his soulmate based on his behaving. Tznuah la tzadik, Prutza la rasha. Tznuah, modest woman to the righteous boy. The opposite of modest, all the way to the opposite side, without saying what it is. Prutza la rasha. Why not reshait la rasha, tzadeket la tzadik? Why not? Why is this? By the ladies, there's no such thing tzadeket reshait. There's only one thing that count. Righteous, it's only someone that is modest. You're not modest, you can never be righteous. But I keep a lot of mitzvot. You'll get reward for the mitzvot. Nobody ever lost from keeping mitzvot. Even a murderer. Even an atheist. He keeps mitzvot, he will get his reward. No matter who he is, he could be the biggest monster on earth. You did something positive, you'll get your reward. If an atheist put fill in, he's going to get a reward. He say, you know what? Just in case there is a God, let me put fill in one time in my life. He will get a reward for it. One time he had an opportunity to eat not kosher and kosher. He ate kosher. He could have ate the other one. He'll get a reward for it. Put mezuzah in his door. He allowed mezuzah in his door. He'll get a reward for it. Everything, he answer amen on a blessing. He'll get a reward for it. He will get a reward for everything. Jews, non-Jews, atheists, tzaddikim, reshaim, smart, stupid, men, women, young, old. Doesn't matter. You did something good, you'll get a reward for it. But what about the punishment? It's endless. Endless. When it comes to lack of modesty. It's machti arabim. Chote u machti en maspikim beyado la asot tshuva en lo chelek la olam haba. Has no share to the world to come. 
Who do you think you're going to be able to wave a flag? I'm an Orthodox woman from Flatbush. I'm an Orthodox woman from Lakewood, from Bnei Brak. Who, who cares about this nonsense? You're going to stand in a trial in front of Hashem. I'm the granddaughter of the, this Rebbe and that Rabbi and this uh, Baba and who knows what. Who cares? The opposite. It's going to make a situation a lot worse. If you're going to come and say, I'm five generations from the Chafetz Chaim. I'm ten generations from the Gaon Vilna. I'm two generations from the Baba Sali. I am uh, three generations from the Lubavitch Rebbe. Who cares? The worse your situation will be. You come from such righteous people and this is how you behave? You are not only a disgrace to Hashem, you're also a disgrace to your grandparents. They would die not to dress like you, your grandmothers, or your grandfathers. All these tzaddikim I mentioned, if they come with a gun and say, look at the not modest woman, if not, we'll kill you, many of them will die and not look. They won't look. How many? The Gemara has example. Matia ben Harash, by mistake he looked at the woman, by mistake. Not like today, a radar on the street. Special top of the line radar. You know? All day. By mistake, Matia ben Harash picked up his head and he saw a woman between me and you. A non modest woman 2,000 years ago was a super, super rabbit sent today. Cover completely. But maybe he looked at her face. I don't know what he saw. What did he do? He took a knife, hid it, and made himself blind. I'd rather not see in my life ever again than to see a non-modest woman. Hashem sent him Alach Rafael to cure him. He refused. No, no, leave me blind. I don't want. No, no, but Hashem doesn't want you to be blind. You, you're too extreme. You need to see. He said, no, I don't want. If, I, if you bring me back my eyesight and I'll have to see it again, I'd rather stay blind. So Hashem said, he said to the angel, only if Hashem promised me that I will never ever fail again by looking at an unmodest woman, I agree to see. If not, I'd rather be blind for the rest of my life. Imagine what level people had 2,000 years ago. Matia ben Haraj. There are people in our generation Maybe not Matya ben Harash, but on very, very high level. I know few, I can tell you, I know few, guarantee that they are watching their eyes already 20, 30, 40 years, non-stop, not even one minute they fell by looking at a, a woman that is not their wife. Mamash, 100% guarding their eyes. No, no, not close environment. Even go out, go out to the street a little bit, crossing the street, coming to the gas station, going on the airport, going on planes to Israel. Not only in close environment. You're right, if somebody locks himself in a room, by the way, that's also not easy. To close yourself in a close environment all your life because you're afraid to walk on the street? You know Rav Shach told Rabbi Aderet, maybe 20 something years ago, he was in his 90s. In his 90s. Do you know what it means to be 95, 97? A person 97, he looks at women on the street. Forget about rabbi. Chiloni. Secular man. 97. Secular. Secular. Walks like this with his cane in the street. What did you see today, grandpa? Huh? He doesn't hear, he doesn't see anything. He's disconnected from the world. Rav Shach said to Rav Aderet, stay in Monsi. Don't come to Bnei Brak. Why? I cannot walk to the street of Rabbi Akiva. There's Rabbi Akiva Street, a major street in Bnei Brak where all the clothing stores are. And <laughs> he was close to 100 years old. He said to him, I cannot come out of my house to the street from what's happening here. Stay over there, at least over there everyone religious. Over here there's a lot of Chiloni, mix, these, Goim, Arabs, worker, construction, Russian that came from Russia. Shem Yerachem, a salad here. Not everyone tzaddik on the street. Stay over there. Rav Aderet himself told me the story. Not from somebody. He said, Rav Shach told me like this. And there are many other examples. So, 
What does it mean to be holy? Gadur be'arayot. Watching your eyes, no internet, no movies, no picture, no goish music. Now walking to Chas Shalom beaches and swimming pool and Pesach in Cancun and in Cyprus and on the yacht and my uncle is a billionaire and invited us to the holidays, a special rabbi, don't worry, we're gonna be in the middle of the ocean, don't worry, the Satan is preparing for you a special cake with lots of poison inside. You think you're gonna go to Cancun and all these places with the beaches and you're gonna get away without sinning over there? You really think so? Where are you living? Where do you live? Gadur ba'arayot, Chazal say. That's a sign if a person is holy. But Rabbi, but that's in style today. Everyone dressed like this. But not, not me, I'm not gonna dress like this. I don't care what they say. Let them make fun. In Hebrew, there is a say that the Chilonim made. Should add it to the Pirke Avot. Tzochek, mi shetzochek acharon. In English, they also have it. Laugh. What's the laugh? Who is who laughs uh, last? Last. In Russian also. Well, the question: Who who learned from who? Maybe the Israeli chilonim. They also they were communists. They came from Russia. Maybe they brought it from Russia. You know what? You reminded me. The Russian wanted to send the first astronauts to space. Over there, you don't have gravity like here. So they told about everything, how to make the spaceship, how they make the bathroom with suction, everything to match staying for months in space. They had only one problem. Back then they didn't have laptops and things like this. So you needed to write everything on a pad. So they say, how are we gonna make a pen that works in space? Because right now the ink comes down because of the law of gravity. But if you don't have gravity, the ink goes up, not down. It flies up. So nothing will come out. So they said again and again in meetings and all the Russian engineers breaking their heads how to make a pen that will be working in space. Until Vladimir, the cleaning guy, had one or two good vodka for breakfast. He came over there. They say, Vladimir, not now, we're working here. Vladimir said, I don't understand. Why you don't use a pencil? <laughs> and all the scientists, <laughs> all the engineers <laughs> looked at him. <laughs> we never thought of it. And the cleaning guy came out with a solution. They started to use pencil and finish. <laughs> Imagine this. Meeting, making a meeting to make a pen that works in space. So let's see what it means to be Kadosh. Abitui Kedusha, meaning Havdalah. What does it mean Havdalah when we do Motzei Shabbat Havdalah? Separation. Separation between Shabbat, which is holy, to weekdays. Separation. <laughs> What does it mean, separation? It doesn't mean that there's mitzvah to torture yourself in life. <laughs> no. That's not what it means. It means to be holy while you're living in this world. Meaning, you have food, eat, don't be a pig. Eat, don't be a pig. You need to dress, dress okay. Don't dress like a homeless that everything is cut and dirty and smells. No, that's not what Hashem wants from a Jew. Dress normal. Average suit. What's considered average? 150, 200 dollars a suit. That's fine. Don't need 10,000 dollars a suit. Special tailoring, Rabbi. The strings are imported from Venezia. Roberto, he came special for me to match it exactly to my neck. The cufflinks in from Hungary. You don't know Pushkash? He made it. Special delivery rabbi, just the FedEx cost me $300. It's not enough with the men with the truck, $5. 
cufflinks that looks okay. Not good enough for him. How many people knows to tell the difference between top of the line suit to an average suit that they sell in Marshalls for, for $200? Also good names. Stuyot. Shoes, $100. Beautiful. Ah, leather, nice, everything. No, no, Rabbi, what are you talking about? This is a $5,000 crocodile, especially from Australia. That's, that's the person that lo loses insanity. The addiction to material makes a person an addict. It's like in everything else in life. How people become addicted to cigarettes, to drugs, to alcohol, to sport, to food, to sugar. There's thousands of different addictions. Pride is also addiction. You're thirsty for attention. You constantly do things to attract attention. When you cannot get attention in a positive way, you begin to get it in a negative way. You're not in the headlines. You're going to get there one way or the other. Not in a positive way. I'll blow up a bus. I'll get there. I'll fight in the street. Let them arrest me. That they see. I have to be on the headlines. I find how to get there. Don't worry. Food. Nobody told you to eat stale bread with onion. Rabbi, I don't eat anymore. That's it. What do you mean? I come to this Bukharian wedding. Seven floors of food. Kebab, steak, lamb, this, kufta, shmufta, salads, this, all kinds of things, this kind of bread, the moon, the, the sun, everything on the table. You know what I eat, Rabbi? Bukharian bread after three days that it wasn't heated, it can break someone's head. When it comes from the oven, first few hours, the most delicious bread on earth. And after two, three days, it was on the shelf. <laughs> It's a very good way to kill someone you hate. <laughs> you hit him on the head, you're done. <laughs> so now, Rabbi, this is all I eat, but I don't eat it. I fight with that for 10 minutes. Baruch Hashem, I take one bite a day. Onions and garlic I always have. One bite, and that's what I do. I'm like David Amelech. And what do you drink? No more whiskey, Rabbi. No more. No more vodka. What do you drink? When I cry that I lose in the stock market, I fill up the cup and I drink my tears. Mamash like David Amelech. He used to drink his tears. Sweet tears. This is what I do, Rabbi. No, no, no. Enough with the show off. That's not what Hashem wants. You want to eat chicken, eat chicken. You want to eat fish, eat fish. You want to eat meat here and there. Not every day. It's not good because the Yetzirah enters the body from the meat. Huh? Once a week, it's, it's on Shabbat, it's good. Shabbat and holidays is good. More than that, it's not that it's not allowed, but the more you eat, the worse it is for you. Spiritually, not only physically. But, if that's the only food today, that's what your mother made. Um, uh, Itzi, I'm sorry, we have leftover from Shabbat. Sunday. What do we have? Uh, the meatballs that I made. You don't like to eat, but that's the only thing she made. You're allowed to eat. Don't be fanatic. No, no, I don't touch meat. It's okay. However, once it becomes addiction, you fail. That's it. The materialism in you won the soul. It's a, fa it's a battle between the animal to the soul. If the body dictates everything, the soul is dead. The body won. You fail in your mission in life. You fail. Some people, they invest 99.9% .9 of their time in their body. You don't believe me? They get up in the morning, they stand by the balcony, two or three cigarettes to start the day. Body. Nicotine, body. Then they make themselves coffee. Body. Then breakfast. Body, reading all the gossip and the Lashon Ara, pride, ego, it's all body. Next, they drive in a fancy car, air conditioned, body. Very expensive car, body. Come to work, nice, very beautiful chair, leather, $500, 
body. Everything body, making money, body, that I can buy more things, more delicious things. Women, body. Sport, body. Gym, all day like this, body. Why they go to the gym? They enjoy to run? I don't know that many people enjoy to run. It's suffering. No, Rabbi, I enjoy to lose weight. <laughs> that I can show off again tomorrow. When I come to the wedding and the, and the dress fit, after I just gave birth, all the eyes of all the other girls will go out. Wow, one month after she gave birth, she's back. That's what they live for. And they call themselves religious, no? It's ironic. Basically everything body. What does he do for his soul? I'm talking someone who doesn't learn Torah. That, what does he do for his soul? Even when he puts filin, it's like a robot. He thinks now, Hashem, I dedicate my neshama, I dedicate my yetzerara to Hashem. No! It's all, let's get it over with and finish. Even he come to pray, does, does he think about one word of what he say? We are growing in such a world today that even you come to your children, they go to good yeshivot, what's considered good yeshivot. Nine years old, 12 years old, 14 years old kids. I want to learn with you the meaning of the words of Shema Israel. 14 years old goes to one of the best yeshivot. American boy. He doesn't know any word of the Shema Israel. He doesn't know word almost in a Birkat Amazon. He doesn't know Birkot Hashachar. Like a robot. How is a person going to love religion when he's 14 and he does not understand almost one word from the entire hour of prayers in the morning? Imagine you have to read words in Hebrew or in English, but it's actually Chinese. Cha -wa 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 -wa. All day like this. Every day come to shul and read words with Chinese, Chinese words, but, but English alphabet. They teach, Robert, they teach in the shul. Yeah? They teach? They don't know. Here and there they have a word that they know. They don't know. I'm telling you, they don't know. Can you suggest us read in English? If you don't understand, of course in English. What's the question? Whatever, better to learn it in Hebrew. You have to make a, an urgent, extremely urgent assignment to buy Hebrew English Sidurim, Hebrew English Chumash, everything Hebrew English, Hebrew Russian, whatever a person understands, Hebrew Persian, Hebrew Arabic, you have everything today. Spanish, you have everything you have today. Baruch Hashem, we live in a generation that Hashem had mercy on us. With the development of technology, with $20, you solve almost every problem that you have today. Imagine back then, you have to write with a feather. Who would translate you the Torah to Spanish with a feather? <laughs> in the ink. Como esta, senor? <laughs> Dios. Oh, the ink spilled. We have to get another card. Bring another goat. Yalla, slather him. Let's take the skin. Let's remove the hair. Let's process it in lime. Baruch Hashem, it's dry. Let's cut it. No, bring a feather, cut the feather special, make the ink, cook it, bring it. El Dios, el grande Dios. Uh, or in Persian, or in French. Baruch Hashem today. One, two days, it's done. Millions of copies. Hashem had a lot of mercy on us. Do you know how, how 500 years ago they printed the Shulchan Aruch? If I'm not mistaken, the first print that came is was Shulchan Aruch. Did you know that? 500 years ago. Do you know how? How did they write the first Shulchan Aruch? They had metal letters, metal. Deep it in ink. And they have a line. And they put the letters in order. And then they put it on a page. They close it. They press down and bring it up. You have a line. Then put the letters again, dip it. <laughs> it's faster to write. That was the first print. We came a long way, Baruch Hashem. So, you want to pray, learn the words of the praying, or take the Sidurim that they have one line Hebrew right next to it in English. Explanation. At least, 
Those are the parts of the tefillah that you must understand what you say. The blessing of the morning. You say, Modeani lefanecha. You don't know what you're saying? Baruch ata Hashem pukeh achivrim. You don't know what you say? Save me from yetzer ara, ayin ara, lashon ara. You don't know what you're saying? What all these requests you're making, you don't have an idea what you're saying? Talking to the wall, what's going on here? Then you have to learn the Shema Yisrael. It's mitzvah from the Oraita. You pray in the morning, you pray in the night. Arvit at night, in the morning. You have to say Shema Yisrael. You have to know the words of Shema Yisrael. From Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, until Hashem Elokechem Emet, you have to know every word. I, I tested my son today, he's nine years old, 20 minutes on his own he learned it. 20 minutes. Gave him a Sidur, English, Hebrew. He went, he said, I'll finish, I'll come back. 20 minutes later, he explained the whole Shema Yisrael. It's not the end of the world. We taught them the Birkot HaShachar. Birkot HaShachar took them almost the whole day. Because there's a lot of, you know, you have to learn. It's confusing. Pukeh HaChivrim, Matir Asurim, for the kids, for American kids, it's confusing. Then the entire Tfilat Shemona Yisrael. One word after the other, it took them, to one of them it took two days, to the other one, one day. It's not, but it, it takes few days, but you at least know. You learn for the rest of your life what you're saying. What, all your life you're going to talk to the world without saying, without knowing what you're saying? I would go crazy. You know what? I got to tell you something. You have to bow down to these Americans that all their life read, 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 coming to shul, read, 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 and don't understand almost anything of what they say. Psh. How they do it? I, I, I have to tell you, I gotta take my hat off for them. How they do it? I will go crazy after one week. Repeating, reading words in a language I have no idea what it means. Just read, to come to read like a robot. <laughs> no understanding what I say. <laughs> Every day, an hour in the morning and an hour at night, Mincha and Arvit. For 5, 10, 20, 30 years without understanding it? Instead of investing 2, 3 days from your time, and now the entire prayers, all your life is different? No, no, you tell me if there's a bigger crime than this. How? How can it be such thing? Especially today when there's no excuses. Bukharian, you have in Russian. Persian, you have in Farsi. Syrian, you have in Arabic. Lebanese, Arabic. Argentinian, Spain, all these languages you have in Spanish. Every language. French, you have in French. Italian even, you have in Italian even. They have everything in different languages. So a person has to know Birkot Shachar. He has to know the Shema Yisrael until Hashem Elokechem. He has to know all the Tfilat Shemona Yisrael. If he, after the Tfilat Shemona Yisrael, he has to know the confession, the vidui. Chatanu, avinu, ashamnu, bagadnu. What are you supposed to have a broken heart with tears in front of Hashem? You're reading it like you read newspaper and you don't understand what you're saying, so what's the point? The point of this confession, and when, when you say it, you have to cry. That's the, the real in, intention when they put this vidui inside. Confession to break the heart. To do tshuva. Not like today in a shul. Ana Hashem, ta 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 ta. Hashem, no bagad, no gazan, no gazan, no gazan, no gazan, no gazan, no finished. 13 seconds. Didn't say three words. Hashem, Hashem, El Rachum Vechanun. He also checked two texts in the middle. You understand? No, what can we do? So to be very lenient and with a major, major mercy and give you a huge discount, the minimum of the minimum, less than that, there's nothing to talk about. That a person, every Jew, no matter what is your language, you have to understand all the Birkot HaShachar, the blessing of the mornings. You have to know the entire Shema Yisrael. And you have to know the entire blessing of Shemona Yisrael, it's 19 blessings, and the confession after the Shemona Yisrael, those four paragraphs in the tefillah, less than that, there's nothing to talk about. Birkat Amazon, the most important thing is mitzvah from the Torah. That was my next thing. Birkat Amazon. 
Every day, almost at least once a day, you do Birkat HaMazon. Once a day, you eat bread. Sandwich here, sandwich there, with the food, with dinner, with breakfast. Even if you do it two, three times a week. And Shabbat alone, you do it three times. And Motzei Shabbat is four times. Four times on Shabbat alone, with Motzei Shabbat. Another three, four, five, six, seven times during the week. Some people do it 16 times a day. Every hour, they have a meal. Fine, <laughs> but I'm talking normal people. Normal people, they need it at least five, six, seven, eight times a week. Eight times a week, you're going to say blessing to Hashem, read, 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 and you don't understand? Mitzvah from the Torah. How long will it take a person to learn Birkot HaShachar, Shema Yisrael, Tfilat Shmona Yisrael, Confession, and Birkat Amazon, if his mind is totally blocked, a week. If he's sharp, three days, all together. If he's super sharp, less than a day. Less than a day. It's possible. Rabbi, what if you can't catch up to the Chazan? You're going to read, but you can't catch up. You... I, have, I have news for you. According to the laws of Shulchan Aruch, most of the Chazanim today are not qualified. Some of them shave with razor, some of them mechalel Shabbat, some of them are infidels, some of them big reshaim that all day type lashon ara in the internet, some of them eat nevelot vetrefot, they buy meat in all kinds of places that is not kosher, contaminate their mind and their soul. Some of them do not know how to talk. I'm talking Israelis that learn knowing Hebrew. They mix between cha and cha, cha. Some has to come from the throat, some has to come from the mouth. They mix between Aleph and Ayn, Ah, and they say Ah, which is a different meaning. It's they're changing a lot of the meanings of the words. Almost every time I went to shuls in the last 22 years, almost always all over the world, almost always the Chazan made minimum one mistake at least, and sometimes 20 or 30 mistakes. Just in Tfilat Shmona So how do you say it? That's why you cannot count so much on the Chazanim today. Some of them send their kids to public school, they cannot be Chazanim. Some of them, their wives do not dress modest and don't cover their hair, they cannot be Chazanim. If they shave with a razor, they cannot be Chazanim. They speak Lashon Ara against rabbis in the internet, they cannot be Chazanim. They mechalel Shabbat, they're 100% like Goim, they cannot be Chazanim. You understand? And finally, if they qualify, meaning they're very righteous, and they're poor, and they have a broken heart, and they pray L'Shem Shamayim. Some of them pray only because they have a nice voice. So they want to now make a show. They think they're in Broadway. It's an opera now. You didn't come really to pray. It's all a show off. So basically, until you find one person that is tzaddik, and his kids are in yeshivot, and he's a ben Torah, and he eats strictly kosher, and he watches his eyes, and doesn't speak Lashon Ara, and doesn't murder people in the internet. He doesn't go to all these fake websites uh, that call themselves religious websites, and all they murder Jews with their Lashon Ara in their website, and he doesn't read his Lashon Ara. You want him to be a lawyer in front of Hashem? What shliach tzibur? What does it mean chazan? Chazan means our lawyer in front of the judge. You have a good lawyer, they treat you in court. You have a garbage lawyer, you're done. You're going to sit 30 years in jail because your lawyer never learned the material. Why? Because his mind is uh, limited. Or he's lazy. Or he's wicked. Or he doesn't care about your life. One of, you choose what it is. What difference does it make? It destroyed your life. Someone Hazan, you let this guy, is beating up his wife. You want him to be the lawyer in front of Hashem? He eats in a non-kosher restaurant. The sign is kosher. Everything else over there is treif. The piece of paper is kosher, you can eat it. <laughs> no restriction from eating pieces of paper. Not a sin. You can eat the sign. Kosher be'ashgachat a rabbi from the moon. <laughs> the sign you can eat. You know, <laughs> there's a famous story that one rabbi went to a restaurant and he asked the cashier there, you have good ashgacha here? It's kosher over here? So Rabbi, come on, what, don't you see? He shows him on a picture, on a wall. Rabbi Kaduri, Rav Ovadia, Baba Sali, Rav Eliashiv, Rav Shach. He showed him all the rabbanim on the wall, a lot of pictures. 
So the rabbi told him, listen, if you, your picture was on the wall and they were here in a restaurant, then it would be for sure kosher. Now when they are on the wall and you are here, I'm not so sure. <laughs> With his jeans and holes and five pounds of gel on his hair and earring over here. He's the mashgiach. Ask him two laws in halachot, in kashrut, he doesn't know. Well, who put you mashgiach? My uncle. He found me a job. <laughs> you understand what I'm talking about here? One more thing we have to know and we finish with that. Many nations, they sanctify the dead people and they worship them. In India, it's very common. They take a person and make him into a god. He turns into a god in his lifetime and after he dies, that's it. They make temples and all kinds of idol worshiping. It's not supposed to be the Jewish way, even though some Jews made that mistake, unfortunately and they follow holy rabbis and start turning them into a god or semi-god or whatever you want to call it. And started to pray to them and to talk and say you cannot connect to Hashem without them and they are the one who will find you your soulmate. And some Jews, out of ignorance, when they go to graves of tzaddikim, they don't understand that it's a very big sin to pray to the tzaddik that buried there. Help me, Baba Sali, help me, save my son from the tribe. That's, you, you have Hashem and you come to a human being that is buried over here, no matter how, how righteous he was. It's a disgrace against Hashem. So why are we going to grave of tzaddikim? First, it's recommended not to go at all. Never. You want to pray, take the siddur in shul, in the house, cry to Hashem and talk to him, that's it. You don't need. Stipler, many of the big chachamim of the Ashkenazim, the Gaon Mivilna writes very strong words against going to cemeteries to pray by the graves, very strong words against it, and many other holy people. Some people say it's mitzvah to go, fine, you want to go, you want to waste hours to drive, to go, fine, you can go. It's not a sin to go. But one thing for sure it's a sin, to pray to a righteous person that it buries somewhere in the world, doesn't matter where. To feel that without him you cannot connect to Hashem. That's becoming already idol worshipping. Sometimes there's a thin line between respecting a tzaddik and asking Hashem that thanks to the merit of the righteous rabbi who buried here, you will have mercy on me. So meaning I came here to pay respect to the tzaddik, thanks to the merit and the righteousness of this holy tzaddik, you will have mercy on me. But who am I talking to? Only to Hashem. Not a word to the tzaddik, chaz v'shalom. Asking a human being something as making him as a god? Hashem irachem, what a horrible sin it is. Of avodah zara. What's the punishment of avodah zara? Death penalty and no share to the world to come. Even if you have a beautiful beard and a very nice big yamaka. Yes, it comes together with Hilul Shabbat. So you come to do mitzvah, you waste hours of your time, and in the end you become an idol worshiper just because you're an ignorant person. Isn't it a shame? That's why most of the people are ignorant. Better not to give them advice to go to cemeteries. Never. Pray in a shul. Pray in minyan. It's fine. But those who insist to go, there are rules. They have to learn the halachot. What to do, what not to do. So many of the nations sanctify the dead. In Judaism, we pay a huge respect to the dead rabbis that passed away from the world. Without them, we would not have what we have. They are the ones who gave their life to pass the Torah of Hashem to us. So obviously, we're never allowed to talk negative against them. We must give them respect. We have to love them and appreciate them. Everything is beautiful but to turn them into gods or all kinds of superpower heroes, that's already crossing a red line that you have to be very careful. By Judaism, we have to sanctify the life that Hashem gave us. Because the Torah says, Ele ha-mitzvot asher yase otam ha-adam v'achai bahem. The purpose of the Torah to keep you alive, to make your life full of, full of meaning to make you fulfill your purpose that you can get life of eternity when you die. 
Of course, you need the information and the knowledge that we gain from all the deceased holy rabbis that lived and passed with their great books. They did the job for us. Without them, we would not be able to do anything today, especially today. We're not in, in a percent of a percent from their level. But to make them into a god and to be depending on them and all kinds of things like this, meaning he's my god, not Hashem, him, it's a very, very serious violation of the 13th principle of Judaism and in general the Jewish ideology. We have a rule in the Torah, pikuach nefesh, pikuach nefesh, life risk, dismiss 610 of the laws of the Torah from the 613. 610 laws are dismissed immediately if your life is in a risk. Include Chilul Shabbat. If your life is in a risk, you're allowed to break Shabbat. Even though it's a worse sin than a murder. You're allowed to break Shabbat until the life risk is over. And many other things. It's called Pikuach Nefesh. The dead people, they have impurity in them. Why? If their bodies were so important, why did Hashem make a law that as soon as the soul comes out, the body becomes very, very seriously impure? If you touch it, the only way to get purified again is only with the ashes of the red cow. Mikveh won't help you. How much impurity a body of a dead person has? Why you run to the cemeteries? For what? The Kohen was standing in a building. Look how big is this synagogue. Look. All the way there, in the end, when you go out by the books over there, that's, I don't know, more than 100 feet. All the way there, Chaz Shalom, somebody fell and died, and Kohen sitting right here. The Kohen is impure. Why? It's covered already with walls and ceiling, it's a oil. If there is a Bet HaMikdash, and he was supposed to go tomorrow morning to Bet HaMikdash, he cannot enter. He lost his shift. Why? He cannot serve. Why? He was standing next to a body. Even if the place is a huge hospital, not 300 feet, 3,000 feet. It's all the way there. You, you stand over here, you became impure. Goim, no. Goim is machloket if there is too much, the goim, the oil. In general, the halacha is no, but we also don't go to cemeteries of goim for few reasons. Why? Maybe they also give, give pure impurity. Because it's, after all, a machloket. And second, do you know how many people that, have, that they thought they go in, they're really Jewish? Do you know how many Jews are not Jewish? Do you know how many goim are Jewish? The world became a horrible salad. Horrible. Someone told me that he did a research. I don't know how reliable it is. Don't hold me. So I'm being careful. Someone told me that he made a research. All the people that their last name is Cohen in America, only 15% of them are Jewish. 85% of the last name Cohen are Goim. Why? Their mother is Goya. A Jew married Goya. He has three or four kids, last name Cohen. They're Goim. Sometimes they think they're Jewish. Imagine you're, you're a rabbi in a synagogue. A person come to you, Cohen, Cohen. Yeah, my name is Cohen, rabbi. Fadal, come to the Torah. Where is the rabbi? Baruchu et Hashem Amvorach. Bechlal Goy, Mizer Amalek. His grand, grand, grandmother was the daughter of Agag. Yes, yes, it's not funny. That's the tragedy of the Jewish nation. It's called Silent Holocaust. And when you say it loud, all the hypocrites and the liars, they all get angry instead of pull their hair off, how much is right this rabbi? You can hate the rabbi, you can hate him, you can go against him, you can do whatever you want, but what about the truth? Does the truth mean anything to you? Don't you see that the silent holocaust destroying our nation? Only 13 million are considered Jews. And many of them are not Jewish. They don't have a Jewish soul because their mother is not Jewish. One Russian woman from Israel sent me an email. She started to listen to me in Hebrew. You know, they brought a lot of Russian people to Israel 20 years ago. So she wrote to me that after she started to listen and she became religious, she wanted me to send her to a place to convert. 
and now she started to tell me the story. Her sister married to an Israeli man, they have three kids, all the kids are goyim, the Israeli men have no idea that his wife and his three children are all goyim. No idea. He's putting his life into them, one day he dies, he comes in front of Hashem, says, you don't have kids, you never got married, you never did pro-orvu. What? I paid three million shekel on the kids, I bought them homes, I put them in universities, I donated a kidney to them, I, I, I have kids, what do you mean I don't have kids? You don't have kids, the kids are going, they're not your children. That's the law of the Torah. I didn't write the Torah. You know, Hashem did not consult with me when he wrote the Torah. Maybe if he would consult with me, one of the rules I would change, you know what it is? It's enough that one of your parents is Jewish, you're Jewish. But it, was it always like this? Always like this. But originally the patriarchs, didn't it go by the fathers? Not by Judaism. The Torah say already 2,000 years ago in the Mishnah that Rabbi Yehuda Anasi collected into the Mishnayot. Abba min Hagoya karu ibna. Avraham Avinu had a son Yitzchak. He had a son Ishmael. Yitzchak came from Sarah. She, did, she belongs to the Hebrew nation. Ishmael came from Hagar, the Arab, the Egyptian maid. Hashem said to Avraham Avinu, take your son, your only son, the one you love, Yitzchak. What about Ishmael? Ishmael was 13 years older. The Torah said to give respect to the older son before to the youngest son. Hashem should have said to Avraham, take your oldest son, Ishmael, to the Akedah. He did not care about Ishmael. The Midrash, the oral Torah said that Avraham fought with Hashem. Avraham Avinu, he walked with his feelings. After all, Ishmael came from his seed. So when Avraham, Hashem said to him, take your son, Avraham said, which son? I have two. He said, the one you love. Hashem expected Avraham to understand. And he said, I love both of them. And he said, the only son, he said, no, but I have, I have two. He said, Yitzchak. Be'Yitzchak, ikare lechazera. Your descendants, are coming only from Yitzchak. What about Ishmael? Two billion Arab came from him. They have nothing to do with you. The Arab screaming, Ibrahim, Ibrahim, our father, Ibrahim, he spread monotheism. You have nothing to do with Ibrahim. Nothing to do with Ibrahim. This is the word of God, not mine. If it was up to me, I just say two minutes ago. If, if one of the parents is Jewish, it, I would write, Hashem, can I put an addition to your Torah? Do you give me permission? This is my opinion. One parent, it will make things a lot less complicated. One of the parents, Jewish, you're Jewish, finished. But, then the entire but I'm not God. Yeah, did I didn't create the world. And I did not do it. And Hashem say, only if the mother is Jewish, you're Jewish. If the father is not Jewish, it doesn't affect. But if the mother is not Jewish, you're not Jewish, and that's the law. And again, I did not write it. You can get angry as much as you want. You are angry at Hashem, not at me. I'm only telling you what the Torah says. Time ran out, and we only finished one verse. One verse. Imagine how much we had to talk about this parasha. One verse only. Kedoshim ti itiu ki kadosh ani. You say that if you would allow one person, like the father, to be Jewish, yeah. No. Then uh, they would actually allow it to be into marriage. And isn't that one thing that What's the problem? That's what I'm saying. Every Jew will marry a non-Jew. The kids will be Jewish, and the Jewish nation will become two, three billion people. And uh, no anti-Semitism, because everyone is Jewish and beautiful. But Hashem has different plan. He doesn't want the Jewish people to be billions. When, uh, the more you are, the less value you have, right? If you have X amount of diamonds in the world, Every carat worth, let's say, $10,000, right? If they'll find now another billion carats of diamonds in the mind, right away, the 10,000 go down to four or 5,000, or maybe less even. Same thing with gold, same thing with everything. If you have unlimited amount of Jews, the value of the Jews won't be so special. Big deal, Rabbi, three quarters of the world are Jews. What's so special? The chosen people. But from seven and a half billion people, only 13 million, it's a small family of VIP, Right away it makes it precious. Now when you read the Torah, you begin to see. You know, I want to finish with one story that I heard yesterday. Actually, I read it on the news. <coughs> From Israel, they tell you what happened here in America. 
Donald Trump, as you know, won the Republican, Republican and he's going to probably go against Hillary Clinton. Who would be better for Israel and for the Jews? It's not so simple, because although Trump is a big supporter of Israel, just a week ago he said to Benjamin Netanyahu, expand the settlements more. The Arabs don't deserve any treatment. Build. Don't care about occupied territory. All the president of the last 30, 40 years went crazy against every prime minister who built one apartment in questionable territory until they reach a peace agreement with the Palestinians. Trump already announced to Netanyahu, before I'm a president, I encourage you, build. It all belongs to you, Israel. You're not going to get it from Hillary Clinton. The problem is that he's also attracted a lot of dangerous people. For instance, who supports him right now? The KKK, the Nazis, the neo-Nazis. Yesterday they put an article that the head of the neo-Nazis, he said we are anxious for Trump to win, that we can purify America from the Jews. That's what he says on the open. It's finally an opportunity to get rid of the Jews. 77% of the Jews anywhere are against Trump. Who is he talking about? The democratic liberal Jews. So they're going to bring chas v'shalom and destruction on us as I'm screaming for more than 10 years already. All these liberals, pro-gay, pro-Palestinian murderer, pro-everything that is against Hashem and against religion, and always win for, uh, uh, vote for Obama and for Sanders and for all these anti-Jewish people. And what will happen in the end? Because of all these educated liberal Jews, Shem Yerachem will bring another destruction on us. Maybe not from Trump, because after all his daughter became Jewish. So I think he's going to think a million times before he's going to do something against the Jews, especially when he gets involved with them in Judaism. But it's all in the end of Hashem. Only Hashem decides these things. He can be a very big supporter of Jews, and one or two Jews will stab him in the back or five, six of them that speaks on the radio with the liberal's opinion will get on his nerve and everything can turn a switch in his head and that will be the end of us. At least now we have where to run to for the time being. Still have to run to, we can run to Israel. Back in Germany there was nowhere to run to. America was closed, everywhere was closed. To go to Israel was very risky and they, the British didn't let in. At least now we have where to run to. Is it that bad, Rabbi? I don't know. It's all assumption what we talk. We are not prophets. I can tell you one thing. Don't ask me how I know. I can tell you right now that the president will be Hillary Clinton, not Trump. Is it good or not? In some way it's good, in some way it's not so good. You know, the good news is that the Jews usually splits between the two candidates. So none of them can say the Jews were against me because there's always going to be advisor and Jewish that gives them money. For instance, Sheldon Edelson, the richest Jew in the world, announced his support to Trump. You know what it means. It's going to give him tens or hundreds of millions of dollars because he has 30, 40 billion dollars and he's 85 or 90 years old almost, 83, whatever he is. It's not going to take his 30 billion to Olam Abba, right? So he's looking to, he always say, I give money and help the ones that is pro-Israel. That's why he's supporting Netanyahu already for 20-something years, gave him tons of money. He sends all the NBA players with the NBA uh, Israeli player, Kaspi, that I told you about. Last year he took all the famous names to Israel on a trip in a private jet of Adelson. Kaspi himself told me when we met, he told me, I take all these, he gave me all these names, I don't know them, but supposedly they're very big names in the NBA. He took them with him to Israel, all over Israel, and who pays everything? Adelson. Why is sending all these NBA millionaire basketball players to Israel? Well, they cannot afford the $5,000, $10,000 to go on themselves. First of all, they're not going to go by themselves. They only go if you send them on a nice, fancy, private airplane, and you're going to do everything for them. You pay and you organize everything. So they have nothing to do. All they have to do is to show up to the flight. Plus, you give them bodyguards and security because by one phone call to Netanyahu, in one minute, everything is ready for them. They don't have to bother with anything. 
So I ask him, but why is he doing it? The answer is to show support to Israel. The mind of the American people, who are their heroes? Who? A rock and roll star, an NBA star, a football star. Uh, you know, these are the people that influence the American mind. So when they see 20 NBA stars from different teams, they all go to Israel and pray by the Kotel, Mishe Berach, Avotenu, Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Uivarech, at Krins, Ben Johnson. What's your name, Mishe Berach? But you cannot reach his head. Pick me up. And they all come, they put Yamaka, some of them even put Filin over there. That's a very good message. Wow, look, oh, my hero is supporting Israel in Jerusalem. It's affecting the mind of the people. If it cost him half a million dollars, a million dollars, what is it for him? From the time they got on a plane until they landed in Israel, he already made 10 times more in a casino there, <laughs> in Las Vegas sand. So when you have so much money, you can do good things with that. Do you have Jews, on the other hand, that they have just as much as money, and what do they do with that? What do they do with that? Donate it to boycott Israel. Jews, American Jews. They do everything they can to destroy us, to close Israeli speakers from coming speaking in universities, to give Palestinians more money that they can murder us more, to fight Palestinian causes in the United Nations. Everything anti-God and anti-Israel, they run to support. The liberal lefties. You have liberal lefties in Israel, you have liberal lefties in America, in Europe it's almost everyone liberal lefties. And as I said for 10 years already, who are the biggest enemies of the Jewish nation? Those liberal lefties, Jews, not Goim. From the Goim we don't expect, he doesn't owe me anything. This Chris, he doesn't owe me anything. He want to hate me, let him hate me. It's written in the Torah, it's Savstonel Yaakov. But I have a brother living with me in the same building in Manhattan, and he looks at me going to the synagogue on Shabbat, and in his mind he despites me because I'm religious, and he wants to marry his boyfriend uh, uh, Moses. Mo Moses and Isaac, Misha Berach, they just broke the glass last night. So they are pro-gay marriage, they are pro-marriage with animals, they are pro-murderers' rights. They pro Hamas rights. They against Israel. Why are you building in Israel? What do you mean, why? Israel belongs to who? We are the only nation in the history that has a divine document that Israel belongs to us. There is no country in the world that can prove that the country that they live in belongs to them. Definitely not America. That everybody knows that they stole it from the Indians. It's not a secret. They're not denying it. They gave them a few casinos in Connecticut and a few rights, and they vanished them. In a generation or two, you won't even remember there used to be Indians here. Now they still have some survivors. They're gone. They stole their land. Look at this beautiful, huge country all the way to Mexico, to here. It was all, I don't, I don't know how many millions of Indians were here. They took their land and kicked them out. And they preach to us, these liberals here in politics, they preach to us, how did you dare to take the land from the Palestinians, knowing there was never in a history a Palestinian nation. Never. They never had an army. They never had a flag. They never had an anthem. They never had a state. They never had a Palestinian army. They never had a representative in the United Nations. Check a hundred years ago picture from Israel. Right there, around their mass, there was no Arab homes. Bichlal. It was all nothing. Nothing over there, by the grave of Rachel in Hebron, in Marat HaMachpelah. There was nothing there, it was all desert. There was never a Palestinian state. It's a bunch of Arabs from different countries that all of a sudden the Arab world decided to turn them into a nation. You can go and check what I told you. Go and Google it. Go check the history. The Palestinians, a lot of their names is El Masri, El Dis. Why? Because from Egypt, he came from Syria. This one came from Lebanon. This one came from Saudi. From Jordan, many of them came. There was never in a history, 2,000 years, 2,000 years since the temple was destroyed that the Jews went on and off to Israel, in and out. Here and there, there was always Arabs in Israel. Not one time they had a nation there. 
There was never a Palestinian nation. Please don't make mistakes between Palestinians and Palestinians. Two different nations. They call themselves after Palestinians. Palestinians is a different nation, Plishtim, in the time of Samson and Delilah. It's nothing to do with Arabs. These Palestinian Arabs never had a nation. Who turned them into a nation? The liberal Jews. They fight for them all over the world, in London, in universities. Someone sent me to, yesterday or the day before a video of the new, the new mayor of London, Muslim. I thought to myself, Muslim, Muslim, not every Muslim is radical and fanatic and a murderer. Some of them are decent, nice people that want peace, right? He sent me a speech. After two minutes, I shouted. I couldn't listen to him. Every he was speaking like the head of the Hamas. Why he became the mayor of London? Do you know how many Jews live in London? They have the power in politics. The Jews vote for him. You know why? To punish the labor. Because every other member of the labor, they're all Nazis, anti-Semites. They say Hitler was a Zionist just a week ago. They already kicked out of their party many of the anti-Semites. They fired them. The Jews went against them and they put a Muslim mayor in London. If it's smart or not, I think it's stupid. Better these famous anti-Semites that constantly speak against Israel than to put someone that in his speech promote terrorism and speak for the Islam taking over the world. You have to see this video they send me, how they put somebody like this as a mayor of London. But please make no mistake, in 10, 20 years, all the mayors of Europe will be terrorists. All of them will be some kind of link to some kind of terrorist organization. Islam took over Europe. It's not a question of yes or no. It's done already. They took over Paris. They're taking over England. They take off Denmark. They take off other countries. England not so bad yet. Not so bad. England is the, is the only country that is not so bad right now. Huh? I, I suggest you go to London to see what's happening. And Belgium also, and basically everywhere. And you know what Gaddafi once say? Gaddafi said what I also say in one of the lectures, very simple. He said, why we have to fight with the Europeans and, the, and, the, and America and the Jews? We don't really have to fight. Brothers, put down your weapon. Gaddafi said, he became a tzaddik. What was his next sentence? We'll fight them with biograph, uh, with uh, birth. Just continue to produce babies. That's it. They have one or two kids, and we have eight, nine, ten. One or two generations, we occupy the world. That's exactly what's happening. Not only they occupying the world as it is, because of the quantity, the Jews run to give them power, the liberal Jews thinking that by being nice to them, they'll have mercy on us. So I conclude, when Chaz Shalom, if Mashiach doesn't come, if we fall in the hands of these Ishmaelim for one day, you don't need more than that. One day Chaz Shalom will fall in their hands, you're not going to be able to count the casualties that we're going to have from them. Because the Zohar say, they are the cruelest nation in the history. And I ask once in my lecture, who is cruel? Who's more cruel? The Nazis or the Ishmaelim? Or the Hamas or ISIS? Who is more cruel? An ISIS terrorist who chop heads off and cuts people like this, like they're cutting a goat? Or a Nazi that took a baby, Jewish baby, and put him in an oven and burned him? Technically, it's the same thing. So it's a monster murderer, and this is a monster murderer. So I to ask which murderer is worse. They bought cruel, anti-Semite murderers. But there's one difference. You know what the difference is? If you come to Hans or to Adolf and tell him, Adolf, you can kill now a hundred Jews in one second. All you have to do is to jump with them into the fire, commit suicide, and all these hundred Jews will fall with you into the fire. And you die with them. He won't agree. He said, I'm not going to lose one hair for these Jews. One scratch I disagree to have. I'm going to kill them regardless. But not on the expense of me getting hurt. 
If I have to kill them by sacrificing from my own hand or life, I let them live. But Ahmed is not going to be like this. Ahmed says, of course, anyway I plan to jump into the fire with them. I want to go to heaven. 72 women are waiting for him, based on the brainwash of the mask. He doesn't know Sheikh Yassin and Arafat will come. Arafat will pull his wheelchair. <laughs> Hi, Muhammad. Why? Hey, you promised me. What happened? You understand the idea here? That they willing to die is going to kill himself and four of his children to kill one Israeli on the street. Doesn't care. A Nazi would not agree to die if to kill a Jew. They hated the Jews just as much. You know, we know history. Nothing is new here. But up to here. If I have to die for, to kill the Jew, let him live. You're going to let the Jew live? Yeah, why do you want me to die? I don't want to die. Muhammad, even if he doesn't have to die, he volunteered to die. <laughs> why? Killing a Jew while I'm dying, I become a shaheed. <laughs> Their politicians, when they speak, in every one of their speeches, include Abu Mazen, that look educated. He went to university in England, in Europe. What does he say? I'm blessing the Shahids. The Israeli members in the Knesset, 14 Arab terrorists sitting in Israel in the Knesset, every day we have to hear their lousy, annoying voice in Hebrew, speaking in the Knesset. Every time one of their murderers murder an Israeli bypass, a passenger on the, on, on the street or in a car or in a bus, they never agree to condemn the act. They always justify it. That's the, free, the price of liberation. I understand why they did it. They get salary from me, from you, from people that pay Israeli taxes. Israel paid their salary. They drive a nice car, they have an Israeli security guy, a beautiful car from the government, pension for a lifetime. They learn in Israeli universities, most of them. They build homes, homes in Galilee without asking for any permits. They don't pay Israeli taxes. They have beautiful mansions on a mountain. The Israeli is afraid to go there. Few times they came to check permits. Right away they make riots, they all ran away. They do whatever they want. An Israeli will build one terrace, one deck, right away, finds all the way from here to the end of the world. Fine, court, jail, whatever you want. They do whatever they want. They don't go to the army. Every kid they have, they get money from the Israeli government. They have 17 kids. They get tens of thousands of shekels salary from the government. And what did they teach these kids? When they're young, they put Israeli flag on the floor. Israeli citizen. Israeli citizen. They step on the, on the flag with all kinds of toy guns. They dress them with Hamas terrorist uniforms and they film it. How they sing in a kindergarten, five years old kids. Itbach el Yahud, murder the Yahuds. We will release Israel with blood. And who pays them for the kindergartens? Who gives them support? The genius Israeli government. Why? The law of democracy, Rabbi. Democracy. Democracy was designed to give rights to minorities that don't have political power, that the majority will not take advantage on them. That's a brilliant law. Why? You have to protect the weak from the strong, because the, wrong, the strong will make him a slave. The, the majority can force on the minority what to do, what not to do. So democracy is freedom and free choice and, uh, and e equality, that everyone is equal regardless of race and uh, color and religion. It's all beautiful. There's only one problem. The ones that design democracy, they never intended that the laws would protect a minority that declared to murder the majority no matter what. Nobody ever intended to give rights to minority of murderers, of terrorists. Only a fool will believe such a thing. We come to help you not to be destroyed by us because we are the majority and you take our helps to take care and, and stab us in our back and you expect to get more rights? 
only in stupid, even in America, if the Arabs would put American flags in Manhattan, or in kindergarten here in New York, with American flags and burn it and fight and they put it on YouTube, what would happen? The FBI would be there two minutes later. The place will be closed. If they ever got money from the government, not only they won't get, they will charge them double for everything they ever got and they put all of them 30 years in jail. And in Israel, they'll double their income in the name of freedom. Why? They have 14 terrorists represented him in, represent them in Israeli Knesset. You understand? Bottom line, future we don't have. We don't have unity among us. The secular people are making more and more laws against religion. Baruch Hashem does Baalei Tshuva, but there's a lot of religious people go off the derech. Future we don't have. There's only one thing can save us, is Mashiach. The way we are right now, I don't see how Hashem will send us Mashiach. If Mashiach comes right now, we are so racist, that the majority of us will not accept him because of his nationality. What? He's not one of us? We don't accept rules from you, I'm sorry. Why? You came from Morocco. So what? No, you came from Poland. You came from Persia. You came from Yemen. You're not one of us. We don't accept from you anything. This is the way we are. You want to deny it, deny it as much as you want. Rabbi, only this I want to marry. And what about that? It's not a Jew? No, no. Absolutely not. Why? Prejudice him. You understand? Okay, I have to run. I have another lecture. So we'll talk to you, Bezrat Hashem, next Monday, Bezrat Hashem, 8.30. Baruch Adonai Lo'olam. Amen ve'amen.